This is for the thumbnail. Since everybody tells me I need to get better at thumbnails, what is stock photography? What is stock photography? Okay, I'm done with thumbnails. Thumbnails are stupid. Let's get into this. This is the video you guys have all been begging for for like six years now. And that's not true because I've only had this channel for like two years. But this is the video you've been asking for for a really long time. What is stock photography? And obviously there's like a thousand videos on what is stock photography. So I'm going to put my own twist on it and I'm just going to dive right into a bunch of questions about stock photography and what that means. So uh, I put them on my phone. I'm here in the studio space in YouTube land in Tokyo, which is awesome. And uh, I'm going to answer these questions that I made myself. It's like a Q&A where I ask myself questions that you guys want to ask but that fit better into video format. So stock photography, stock photography, what is stock photography? Stock photography is, it's a stock of photography. It's a stock of photos. It's a bunch of photos in a vault, in a digital vault. So um, I don't know how to describe stock photography any better than um, it, it's a stockpile of photos. It really is that simple. Let me explain it maybe by talking about the, the perspective of a photo buyer. Let's say you're a marketer and you want to buy a photo of a cat that's dressed like a nurse for a t-shirt. You can scour the internet trying to find the perfect photo. Then you can deal with the photo shooter who may or may not be willing to sell that photo and spend tons of time trying to get your cat in a nurse uh, outfit photo for a t-shirt. Or you can just go onto the internet, onto a stock website, search cat nurse and find the photo and make your t-shirt. Basically, stock photography is a way of stockpiling the world's photos to make it easier for people to find work. It's like a cooperative. It's like the farmer's market of photography. It's where everybody comes together with their images and then they sell them. And I guess that's the simplest, actually that's probably the most over descriptive description of stock photography in the history. But that is what stock photography is. Stock photography are websites that have vaults of images that people can buy. So when we talk about stock photography, there's actually two types of stock photography. There's rights managed, and there's micro stock. And they are very, very different ways of selling images. Rights managed. Rights managed is what you'd think selling photos is like when you start off as a photographer. They're big sales for lots of money, for exclusive usage. Basically a rights managed stock site, like Tandem Stock, Stills in Motion for example, they have a stockpile of images and then photo buyers say, hey, we wanna buy this image. And then they negotiate a price for you on the rights for that image. So whether their usage is exclusive, whether it's non-exclusive, how long it's going to last, what type of usage it's going gonna, it's gonna to be for. If it's for a magazine, is it going to be a cover, mid-page, a full spread, a series of images? They do all the negotiating for you. And then of course they take a pretty handy cut. Most rights managed stock agencies take a cut of like 75% of the image to maybe 50% of the image. So they take a big chunk of it, but they do a lot of the work. And without them, you probably might not have been able to sell the photo in the first place. So very, very handy. And they're selling to newspapers and magazines and websites that have a huge distribution. So the sales from rights managed are very high. For example, I've sold a bunch of images for Bing, Bing.com there, and they sell at like $500 each. I've also sold images for magazines, and they've sold at like $750 each. You could land something massive through a rights managed agency, like a billboard that might be worth thousands of dollars. So you might not get a lot of sales in rights managed, but when you do get sales, they tend to be pretty big ones. So it's low volume, high reward. On the other hand, Microstock, as the title kind of mentioned, Microstock is massive volume and small reward. In fact, when you start off selling Microstock images, you're making like 25 cents per image, which is a tough pill to swallow for photographers. And what Microstock is, is let's say you're a photo buyer and you're buying a ton of images just for very, very small usage. Um, you're a marketer or a PR agent and you just need a bunch of small images or vectors and, th and things like that without a huge distribution. 
You buy a subscription to a micro stock site like Shutterstock, which I've put a link to in the description below. You might pay like, I don't know, $500 and you'll get to select as many as 100 or 200 images a month. So every single month you might just go through all the entire stock and just grab hundreds of images. And then the photographer gets their cut, which with Shutterstock, for example, I think it started out at 20%. The photographers only get 20% of the cut. And by the high end, the photographer is getting about 35% of the cut. So you're only making sometimes 20 cents an image, 35 cents an image. But, and there is a but, with micro stock, the profits can be big. In fact, one image might sell a thousand times. It might sell 5,000 times. In fact, I had an image from Dubrovnik that was actually kind of a snapshot that I handheld that has turned a thousand dollars profit over the years. And yes, that means it has like 3,000 photo sales or something like that, but they're small usage. In fact, I've never ever seen that image out in the world. So yeah, again, high volume, small reward, but that small reward can accumulate over the years and lead to a really nice residual income. When talking about stock photography, we also have to talk about editorial versus commercial because they are very, very important in, in stock photography. Editorial photos are photos that you've taken that are news related. It doesn't mean that they have a person in the photo, but if it does have a person in the photo, it can legally be run as news. For example, if I'm on the streets here in Tokyo and I snap an image of some person during a rainstorm that's crazy, there's, and then there's a crazy weather news story up somewhere in the world and they buy that image, I can sell it to them without having to get permission or a consent form from the person I photographed because it's news. And on the same lines, I can submit images like that into stock photography as long as I check the box saying it's editorial. Now, the commercial side of things is so, so different, especially in stock photography. To sell an image of a commercial nature, which means, um, let's say, I take a picture of Tokyo and my favorite airline in the world, sarcastically, Alitalia <laughs> buys that image from me to sell their, their uh, flights to Tokyo, which you should never take. When they do that, that's a commercial sale because that image is trying to sell something. And that's what stock photography really, that's where the bread and butter of stock photography is, is the commercial side of things. And to be a commercial valued image, meaning you can legally sell it on commercial platforms, there needs to be no people, or if there is people in the photo, they need to have consent form signed. There needs to be no brand in the photo, so you can't have like a billboard that says Coke somewhere in the background, that, that's not allowed. You can't have um, buildings that are copyrighted. For example, the Eiffel Tower, if it's lit up at night, you cannot sell that as a commercial image because of the copyrights that are on um, the Eiffel Tower, it's crazy as that is. So that's the massive difference between editorial and commercial. As a travel photographer, this is always the battle because I always have to be thinking about stock photography as well when I'm shooting. So I might take one image that has some people in it, but then I might also try to get another photo that has no recognizable people. So what images sell on stock photography? The answer is pretty much anything sells, to be honest. Personally, I've had a lot of success with travel destinations, the kind of like hero images. Those sell really well. But you don't need to be a travel photographer to do stock photography. In fact, the highest selling images on stock photography, they're usually like sports teams or like studio stuff. They're like, take this exact studio here in Tokyo and there's just a guy in a business suit and a woman in her business suit looking at each other and some report. And that photo sells like crazy because that's what a lot of people are buying. They're looking for images in stock photography that they can use in brochures or job applications or, or stuff like that. So you definitely don't need to be a travel photographer to stock photos. In fact, when I was starting in photography, I was desperate to make money. So I was taking pictures of everything. I would go around to my parents' house and I would pick out household items and just photograph them. I was photographing the flowers in the garden. 
I was photographing the meals that we were eating. I photographed absolutely everything to try to get them into stock. And if it exists, there's stock images for it. There's stock images of crayons. There's stock images of nails and screws and stuff like that. You can literally put any type of image into a stock portfolio as long as it steamed sellable. So just because you're not in exciting places doesn't mean you can't upload to stock. That brings me to the obvious question of who should you stock with? And it's not exactly the easiest answer for me. Um, from a rights managed standpoint, I'm represented by Tandem Stock Stills in Motion. But to be honest, I've kind of gotten away from posting, not just there, but kind of everywhere, just because I've been so busy with other styles of photography that I haven't really, I really haven't wanted to spend the time to do it. Tandem Stock Stills in Motion is mostly outdoors focused, they're adventure focused, they're outdoor sports focused, and they're fantastic, they're amazing. And over here, on the micro stock side of things, I stock with Shutterstock, um, not exclusively, but that's the only place I ever really saw a lot of value. That's the only place that I saw a ton of money. There's other micro stock agencies, obviously, like Getty has one, Adobe has one, Dreams Time, Fotolia. Fotolia was probably the second they were probably the second best one that I got in terms of making money from. I know a lot of people in Germany and Europe use Fotolia, but Shutterstock by far, without a doubt, was the one place I saw the most success. Again, there's a link in the description of this video to Shutterstock. So if you're thinking about Microstock and you're thinking of doing that, then check out that um, their platform. Also, you're going to run into, no matter who you stock with, exclusive versus non-exclusive. Exclusive means that if you upload your images to their stock portfolio, you can't upload it anywhere else. Non-exclusive means if you upload it to their stock portfolio, you can upload it to a hundred other stock portfolios if you want as well. And there's advantages to both. On the exclusive side of things, your value is going to be higher. Micro stock agents usually give you like an extra percentage of commission if you stock those images exclusively with them. But of course, you potentially lose value because you've lost opportunities to sell that image elsewhere. So it, it's kind of this battle of balance. Personally, I never upload exclusively to Microstock. Never. Absolutely never. Because I don't want to ever have the opportunity to sell my image to like a big client later on because it's been in my Microstock. I don't want to have an image of Alberta that's a good image in my Microstock selling and then a client coming to me and saying, hey, we want to buy that image for a billboard. We'll pay you $2,000. And me going, no, because it's making 25 cents over here. So I don't do exclusive in the micro stock. I do do exclusive in rights managed because I know that they're going to try to get the absolute best value for my image possible. I know you guys are thinking money. You wouldn't be watching this video unless you were thinking money. How much money can you make from stock photography? And honestly, that depends on a thousand different variables. Talking about micro stock, for example, the profits are down to what they used to be just because there's so many images there, but there is still value depending on how many images you get in. For example, over at Shutterstock, if you can get a thousand images into your portfolio, I think you're probably looking at about $200, $300 a month. At a rights managed agent, if your stuff is good and you can get 2,000 images into a rights managed portfolio, you could be looking at about $400, $500 a month or more. And now those numbers don't sound great. They don't, in fact, they sound terrible. If you're a photographer and you're only making $500 a month or $250 a month or something like that, you're not doing well for yourself. But the beauty of stock photography is the residual and passive income side of it. For example, I haven't uploaded a single image to my micro stock in almost a year now. And I'm still making that $150, $200 a month. That means over this past year, I've made like $1,000 to $2,000 while not uploading a single image. On the same side of things, my rights managed, I haven't uploaded since last spring, almost a full year as well. And again, I've made like a couple grand in the past year on images that I sold over that way. So it's really important not to think on a small scale, but on a big scale. And if you've been following my channel for a while, you know I used to talk about the Income Octopus having a lot of different streams of income. Stock photography should definitely be one of your streams of income. I gotta be honest with you, I love having this studio space here, but I find it so hard to sit down and talk in front of the camera 
for this long. I just wanna go and do fun things. I wanna show you guys out in the field the stock photography side of things. So if you're new to this channel, that's this isn't usually what I do. Usually we're out in the world and I'm showing you guys life as a travel photographer behind the scenes. We go out on shoots, I take you on photo shoots, I show you how to make a stock photo in the field. So. So subscribe to the channel and you'll be able to see those vlogs. Now, uh, I'm getting distracted. Back to stock photography. Why should you stock? Why should you upload your images to stock or who should upload their images to stock? I'm a big believer that if you're a professional in this field and you've been a professional for a long time, it's maybe less important to upload to stock. For example, I've stopped uploading to stock. And not because I hate the platform or I felt like I was being undervalued or anything like that. I'm just too busy. T stock photography is very time consuming. And eventually, if I eventually get an assistant or I get some more free time, I'll have that assistant or I'll spend my free time uploading to stock because there is some value there. If you're a new photographer, you're new in photography, you should definitely be uploading to stock because it's a way of starting to build your value. It's a way to spend your time that's productive in your early years of photography. I spent like four years, five years uploading to stock and building that value. But beyond building that value, I really learned the value of a good photo. I learned what sells, what doesn't sell. And shooting all the time for stock and, and just shooting in general gave me something to do. It gave me a way to practice my skill. It gave me a way to grow. If you're new in photography and you don't wanna work for free, you're refusing to do internships and, and apprenticeships and stuff like that, you refuse to work for free, stock photography is a way for you to go out and practice your skill and still maybe, hopefully, get some money from it. And I think that anybody starting in photography should try to upload to stock and should try to get into stock photography. The other advantage to stock photography is it will make you a good technical photographer. I'm a good technical photographer because of stock photography. And I don't think I would have become one if I didn't do stock photography. Because stock photography is cutthroat in that when you upload your images, if they're not 100% sharp, 100% noise free, the light's not perfect, everything's not perfect with that image, it will get denied. So stock photography made me a better photographer because it forced me to really, really become a perfectionist when it comes to the technical side of things. When I'm uploading stock or when I'm just organizing my files, regardless, I have a very, very set way of selling photos. Basically, let's say I take 10 photos in Japan. Those 10 photos I consider have value. Of those 10 photos, I submit them all to potential buyers that might be buying images directly from me. Different commercial clients, editorial clients, whoever, because that's where the absolute best value is. So I'll send those 10 images to different potential buyers. They have a look at them. They might buy two. Let's say they buy two, I'm left with eight images. Of those eight images, I then submit them into the rights managed side of things because I think that the rights managed is the second best value. So those eight images go there, they might select four to end up in their stock, and then those le leftover four images, I put them in micro stock. I drop them in micro stock because I think that's where they have the least amount of value, but I still wanna make something out of it. It's better for me for those images to make small amount of money than for them to sit on my hard drives and not make anything at all. So that's the way I process kind of things when I'm uploading to stock, clients first, Rights managed second, micro stock last. I am losing my voice. So this will be the last thing I wanna talk about with stock photography, and that's about the downside. Is there a downside to stock photography? Yes, obviously. There's a downside to stock photography in that you're potentially undervaluing yourself. So the biggest downside of stock photography, especially micro stock photography, is that you're giving your images away for way less than they're worth. So I think one of the most important things for you guys to understand when it comes to stock photography is that micro stock photography almost should become your leftovers. If you take great images that you think can sell, don't just chuck them in micro stock right away and let them, let them make their tiny little bit of profit there because you're not getting your value. Hang on to them. Make sure you get the best value out of them. The other downside is that it's so time consuming. Doing stock photography, especially micro stock photography, means that you're gonna spend a ton of time 
uploading images, keywording the images, tagging the images, adding titles to the images. It's just, it's a time consuming process and it's definitely more time consuming than the initial value and the initial return suggests. So I think a lot of people give up on stock photography right away because of that. They spend like a week doing it. They see, ah, oh, I've made 35 cents and I did a week's worth of work and that's hard. And I do get that. I get that that's the downside, but stock photography is one of those things that if you plug away at it for a long time and you're really like strict with yourself about submitting, eventually you'll start to see a lot of value. I know photographers that make 100% of their living from stock photography. In fact, I have a friend who does stock photography, but he also does stock drone videos and stock time lapses. And he made so much money on stock as a travel photographer and travel time lapser and drone photographer and stuff like that. He made so much money in the stocks two years ago that he didn't work for an entire year. He was like, I'm gonna take the year off. And he lived off of his stock profits from that year because again, it's residual income. So if you work really hard, you stock the right stuff, you can make a lot of money and you can make a residual passive income as well, which I think is really, really key. So that's it for the stock photography video. I feel relieved because finally I've done the stock photography video you guys have been asking for for two years and now I can go back to vlogging, which I love doing and I can feel guilt free about vlogging again. But I am gonna try to do videos, business related videos, sit down videos like this about once a month or so, hopefully. And hopefully I can get into YouTube spaces like this in London and Berlin and wherever else I am in the world um, to help film them. So I don't know which video is coming next from the business. I think I'm going to talk about um, marketing mistakes that photographers make because let's be honest, there's a lot of them. And I guess I'll see you guys tomorrow on a vlog. I'll have a vlog tomorrow. Just the way I like it. I'll see you guys there. Peace.